<laughs> yes. All right, so the, the materials are already up online. I do some of the behind the scenes to show you exactly what we're including and where. You want this like above my tie so it doesn't rustle over every single time? Yeah. All right. Do it this way. Yeah. Good enough. Um, so I'll show you some of the behind the scenes. I'm going to give you a, a, a I'm going to paint with a broad brush a lot of the things that we could uh, do in terms of authentically, effectively using technology in our classrooms while still paying attention to the Common Core State Standards. And then uh, one of the other things I tried to weave in here is the new Mozilla Web Literacies that are, uh, that are out. They're not on their way out, they're out now. Um, I've been working with Mozilla to try and help uh, identify the web literacy. So if you Google the Mozilla web literacies, all the details will come up. Um, I also have all of the materials for this talk up on Google Docs. And I readily blog about it and share all the materials for my talks on my blog, which is at woioburn.com. Uh, so what I'm going to do is zoom through a lot of materials. Um, please understand that this is an intro. Okay, this is a, a, a taster of some of the ways that this will head. Come on in. Um, so all the materials are up on my blog. Come on in. You've already seen this before. You already know this. I just wanted to walk in. He, he was embarrassed to come in because it was all adults. And I thought, no, it's, oh, no, no. Come on in. So we have uh, the, all the materials are up online. At any point, feel free to share to come and get in touch with me. Um, but basically, at the beginning of my talks, I like to put up, you know, an initial like tweetable summary. I like to say, okay. "Yeah, everything's great. How are you doing?" Good. Just yeah. to make sure you're all set. Come on and sit down for 20 minutes. Oh, I got to get ready for my own thing. All right. Looks like it's going well. Yeah, it's good. It's a good group. Good. So we're gonna I use a tweetable summary because a lot of times we get lost. So if I have a blog post or uh, or I share something online or even a talk for classes, I'll put an initial summary at the beginning just to keep myself framed for the most part and then also my students. Um, one of the things that you need to understand about where I'm headed with this is that I view technology as a literacy issue. I don't think technology is a tech issue anymore. Um, we know from the fact that our, our governments and businesses are taking information about us daily. Uh, we also know from uh, if we look at the way that social media can be used to empower nations. If we look at the Arab Spring we realize how much power really is involved in technology. Um, so this is a, it, it's a literacy. This is a fundamental you know, right. This is a social imperative. We need to empower ourselves and empower our students. Uh, we can no longer say it's just a tech issue for somebody down the hall. I look at it, and as a literacy issue, I view it as uh, using the RAND reading heuristic. So if we look at it as a form of reading or a form of writing, it's a lot easier to understand. And there's three components of that. There is the, the reader, the text, and the activity. Um, so if we talk about having students read and write in our classroom, how do we do that? Like how do we really find ways to make it meaningful in our classroom? Um, the challenge is that we don't really get much guidance from the Common Core State Standards. They're tremendously limiting in terms of using the internet. Um, and then also the other challenge is that the, the researchers don't really help us out either. So I was a member of the New Literacies Research Lab at UConn. I work, uh, we talked about, Mozi so far in this talk we've talked about web literacies, we've talked about new, di new literacies, digital literacies, techno literacies, 21st century literacies. All we do is confuse people. So uh, my colleague Greg McVary and I, Greg is out in the hallway with better hair, uh, we developed three cornerstones and we call this the ORMS curriculum, the Online Research and Media Skills Curriculum. This comes right out of Common Core State Standards. We basically say if you can have an element of each one of these parts in your work, if you can have students do each one of these pieces, you can say that you're authentically, effectively using technology. Okay? So real brief, online collaborative inquiry, that's students collaborating, co-constructing, I'll go back one, information. It's, it's a bunch of kids editing a wiki, a, a wiki in your class. Working together, researching together, putting information together in one spot. There's a lot of free tools out there that you can use. 
I'm a big believer in free. Free is a great price point. Uh, so we can use Wikispaces, we can use Google Docs, Google Groups, uh, Blogger. Use a blog platform in our classroom to have students blogging over time and reflecting on learning. I have a want to take a look at how we can do this with Wikispaces. So with a school in uh, Connecticut, I had students, they were developing a wiki for all the books in the library. Because back in the day when I was teaching English, uh, I would sit there and I wanted my students to read. So I would have a, a book that they would pick out and it would be silent, sustained reading. And I'd go to the library and say, well, what sort of book do you like? You know, do you, do you like mystery? I don't know. Do you like science fiction? I don't know. Do you like uh, autobiographies? I don't know. So it, it, it got to the point where I'm just showing kids books. You know, does this look good? Does this look good? Like a used car salesman. Um, and then I look on the other side of the library, and the library media specialist is doing the same thing. I'm like, why are we doing this? So we had students start building using book talks and populating a wiki for the building. Okay, so this is an example of online collaborative inquiry. Over time, Can I add yeah. A little thing that I heard about um, with the library project like that was that a librarian um, got the kids to make QR codes and stuck it on the book, and then the kids did reviews of that book. Either it was video or it was a document. And so when um, kids came to the library, they came. With, they 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 liked it because they could use their smartphone. I guess it's high school. Yeah. Or a permissive school. And they came with their smartphone, and they, it was a whole other way of visiting the library because they did it through QR code and then um, listened to a, a peer talk about the book. I love that because my the the impetus for this was that you know my students would write a book talk, and they would either print it out for me and hand it to me. And I would read it and annotate it and grade it and hand it back to the kid. And then that learning was dead for the most part. Or they would email, in a paperless system, they'd email me or give me a Google Doc. And it's a one-to-one -one conversation with the work. And it doesn't really benefit anybody. Come on in. Whereas if I open up the doors and say, OK, now anybody can use this. Any student can use this. Um, so I mean, the work that you're doing and sharing, what if? Everybody else here wanted to read your book talk or learn about the book from you. There's power involved in that. Um, there's also a lot of teaching involved in that. You know? So it, if we look at building up these skills, I'll skip past the video. These are all on, online, ready to go. Um, but for online collaborative inquiry, we're, we're having students collaborate, co-construct information, co-construct text. Online reading comprehension. Uh, this is the work that we conducted at UConn. This is uh, the knowledge, skills, and dispositions as students question, locate, evaluate, synthesize, and communicate information. Uh, as I've stated earlier, there's a lot of research behind all this. There's a lot of work. There's a lot of great ideas. Um, but this is just an overview of the cornerstones and what they sort of look like. Some great tools out there. Anybody use Digo? Yeah, Digo rocks. There's a lot of front time that you have to load up. But for some of our students that have struggles reading online, you can sort of cherry pick and, and self-select and then annotate web pages that you want kids to look at. Um, I use Evernote probably a little too much. Uh, I think I might have an addiction. Uh, Google Custom Search, you can make a sandbox. You know, So you can make a, a, a whole search engine for your classroom and pre-populate it with all the websites you want your students to be able to use. And spreadsheets and forms is a great way to build some online assessments, some worksheets. Um, I wanted to show some work. This is a, a great example of a lot of text on one screen. Right now, what happens is cognitively, your eyes just wash all over it. You don't pick up anything. Um, I wanted to see, uh, back when I was teaching high school, I had my kids reading about Huck Finn. Uh, it was a, 10th, it was 11th grade English class, and a lot of my kids basically said, um, I don't care about Huck Finn. Could care less. Has nothing to do with me, nothing to do with my life. Um, they, for the most part, uh, were correct. Uh, they thought that they, they said, well, we don't live near a river, um, which was not a true. We had a, a river right nearby, but that didn't sway them. Um, what also, I tried to get my kids to tie into Huck Finn because um, right near where I was teaching, was Amherst, Mass. I taught in, in Chicopee and Springfield. And right near me in Amherst, Mass, uh, the book is banned. 
So I had a lot of teachers and students all blogging and they were on the news complaining about not being able to read Huck Finn. And so that swayed a couple of my students, but not a lot. Um, for those of you that teach middle school or high school, you realize that swayed probably like two or three out of 100. Um, so what I did was I started to have my students blog about it. So I was teaching English, partnered up with my social studies teacher, and we had students blogging across the two classrooms. So in my class, they were reading Huck Finn and talking about the issues in the text. Then in social studies, they were learning about First Amendment rights, Bill of Rights, you know, freedom of speech, censorship, stuff like that. So we used the blog as a way to connect the two classes. Um, so they would go online and they would define what censorship meant to them, all the stuff that you already do as great teachers. Um, but then one of the fun things is at the end, I basically asked the question, is censorship ever justified? And they posted this on their blog. Uh, so I had a, a bunch of high school students all posting, and then I wanted them to identify if they thought censorship was ever justified. Now this was targeted because this was the end of the school year, and in my high school, um, it was senior week. So the, the you know, uh, morale and behavior started to progressively devolve. And then the administration tried to take more and more things away from the students. Uh, so they were very keen on what censorship and you know, all that was all about. Um, I also wanted them to interview somebody on the faculty. I said, I want you to go talk to one of my colleagues and ask them if censorship's ever justified. And then come back and tell me what they say. I want you to talk about that. Um, and it was kind of information, it, it was very, very interesting to see what my colleagues were, able, were willing to share and then have students talk about. Uh, so the, this is, you know, the tool doesn't really matter. If we talk about online reading comprehension, we're using the internet as a, as a text, as a, as a way to provide opportunities for kids to read and communicate. Um, the last chunk I want to talk about is online content construction. For me, this was the, the real missing element. This is probably my favorite part. This is kids going online and, and creating. It's developing a sense of identity. It's, it's you know, building something. It, to me, it was almost uh, you know, what I would do when I had students write in my classroom, or, or write poetry, or uh, go to art class and create. And the cool thing about this is using the internet, there's so many free tools that we can use as, as a way to really play with digital media and digital content uh, for free. And that's incredible. Uh, the researcher in me would say that our kids are constructing, recreating, or remixing online texts. We live in a mashup culture, okay? And so we have an opportunity to empower our students as readers and writers <coughs> of online info. And then also our kids are encoding and decoding meaning. So there's some great tools that we can use. Uh, some of my students will murder me because I keep you know, promoting screen casting and screen captures. I think we all need to be experts in screen captures and screen casts. You need to be an expert in taking a picture of your screen and annotating it and sharing it with students. You also need to be an expert in making a movie from what you see on your screen, making a screen cast and talking people through or talking your students through what you see on the screen. Then you put it on your YouTube channel. That's what my YouTube channel is, a bunch of boring screencasts of myself. Uh, SoundCloud is audio podcasting, great tool. Storify I'll talk about, and Google Sites I'll show you at the end of all of this. So Storify, anybody use Storify? Yeah, Storify is a really powerful tool. It'll take social media and let you cherry pick social media to compile a story. So you can go on Twitter, Facebook, Google Sites, YouTube, Flickr, pretty much anything, and make a story. One of the negatives about Storify is that it takes social media and let you cherry pick it and use all those different elements to make a story. So you go on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and everything else. Um, so you have to really be careful about how you use Storify. I would suggest if you want to use it, and I would definitely play with it, is you use it initially as a teacher to, use, uh, to start off a unit and develop uh, background info. An example of what it looks like, when the Mars rover landed, I was stoked. Um, and I used Storify to document this. So I had the, the Wikipedia link in Storify. So it makes this very linear you know, story about uh, what's happening. 
and then I pulled the somebody did a little mashup of a uh, you know Wally, you know, and then Wally's big in my house. I have a three year old, so I put that on there. Uh, I love this piece as I pulled the, the picture from the JPL labs of all the engineers hugging. Uh, and then <coughs> Zenny Jardin, uh, a great uh, writer on Boing Boing and on Twitter, she basically shared, I'm inside the presser, eight NASA and JPL engineers and administrators on the podium, not one woman. Let's change that. So what I wanted to do is provide, I, I wanted to put this up with my students and juxtapose those two issues. Because I wanted my students, pretty much high school population, to say, why is that? You know, and, and start to have a little bit of dialogue. So the, the three cornerstones are there. Um, you know, online collaborative inquiry is kids co-constructing information. Online reading comprehension is using the internet as a text. And then online content construction is, is making. It's creating. It's, it's composing. Um, but the truth of the matter is, that's way too much info for one seat time. So what I did is, I decided, OK, I want to take this information, and I want to put it openly online. Because if we sit down and we just go through that, it's way too much info. There's a lot of times that we spend weeks. I just We did a session at the, with the Mass New Literacies Institute. We're in Cambridge for a week at the Nerd Center, and we had a whole week, 8 till 5 every single day, going through those three cornerstones. It's a lot of info. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out a way to share this information openly online. Now, if I'm not mistaken, so I will grab that. So what I did was I used Google Sites. And I built an open ed resource. Some people will call this thing a MOOC. I don't care what you call it, as long as it provides some benefit for people. Where's Note? Mm -mm -mm. This is what happens when you go to the cloud, and you suddenly look for Word, and Word hides. So I used Google Sites, and I used it for two reasons. One was I wanted to make an open ed resource that anybody could use. The second reason was I wanted to push my boundaries and push my thinking about what I could use Google Sites for. How many of you use Google Sites for your own classroom website? Yeah. Um, it's a lot of our schools, what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll pay for you to use a certain site, um, and then they'll lock it down and not give you the support, whereas Google Sites, oh. So I will hit that space there. So it's not showing up for me. Basically, it's sites.google.com slash site slash orms model. And I'll share this out over Twitter uh, so you can grab it. So ORMS model is ORMS, Online Research and Media Skills. That's what we've been talking about. But I wanted to give you a brief walkthrough of what this looks like. So this is all built in Google Sites. This is all free tools. This is all openly online. It's an open ed resource. I'm a big believer in open. I think that there are too many. I think there's too many challenges in our schools. There's a lot of uh, schools that are failing. Uh, there's a lot of students you know, and, and teachers that, that are having uh, a tough time in schools. And we have the opportunity to use technology as a way to empower our students and empower ourselves as educators. Um, so I wanted to, to create an open ed resource. This ties into Common Core State Standards. It ties into the Mozilla Web Literacies. And it's got a little extra frosting on top that I will initially talk about, and then my colleagues in the back will walk you through uh, the, the finer details. Um, so this is an open ed resource. This is always online, as long as Google uh, doesn't kick me off. And I have five modules in here. So the, the middle three modules, I already gave you the overview of. Then the first one is multimodal tutor tutorials. So that's a screen capture, screencast idea. 
The last one is digital identity. This is me basically saying you need to create and curate an online brand. You need to have a learning management hub. You need to have a, a digital identity. And then what we do is each one of these modules has a set of teaching materials. So if I go to online reading comprehension, I have on the intro page an initial overview. I have learning outcomes, the learning standards. So here's from Common Core. And here's, uh, it, this one is the exploring strand in the web literacies. And I link out to the web literacies. There's a pre-survey built in here. The pre-survey is built into Google Forms. And then I have a couple sub-pages within each module. So I'm digging deeper. So here on this page, I have a lecture built in Google Presenter. Then up top, I have a screencast, basically me reading it to you. So if you're a cord cutter, you know, or if you can't get to sleep late at night and you want to listen to my voice, you have me at any point. So I have a lecture in there to give an overview, a more detailed overview of each area. I have a bunch of readings built in here. A video gallery, all links out to YouTube. And then the last piece I have built in is all of this. It, we know from, from good teaching, you, know, you want to be able to read about and think about the ideas, but you really learn from discussion. And you learn from talking to others. So what I did is I set up a Google Plus community and a Google group and connected it to the Google site. Um, and it's a way for I, I give you an initial post to talk about or an idea or a reflection question. And you go out and you respond to it in the community. Um, and that is all right here. So there's already a couple people in there responding and thinking and talking about this. Um, and basically, this is a way for us to take a lot of these skills, but drill a little bit deeper in. Um, any questions before I go to the last chunk? Bless you. Nada? So the last piece I built on here was a, I worked with an awesome set of grad students. We developed a set of digital badges. We developed our own open badge initiative. Because the thinking was, OK, this is a MOOC. OK? It's an open ed resource. It's a class. Uh, but the honest truth is, who cares? I mean, honestly, what's the benefit? Why is it there? Um, I think that this material is, in, is valuable. I think that this is a great way to frame our use of technology in our classroom. But the, the truth of the matter is, what does it mean? Like, why is it there? Um, one thing that really hit home for me is back in the day when I was running PDs in my school district, I would cobble together a lot of tech resources and curriculum for those August PD days. I would foresee this would be a, a great series. This would be a whole a PD schedule for like a whole year at a school. So you could take a cohort of teachers and bring them through there. The, the materials and the resources are all openly online. So you could take this and run with it and basically you know, run PD in your building or your district and use it. And that's awesome. That's, you know, that's one of the beliefs in, the, in open ed resources. But in order to try and structure some sense of community, what we try to do is we set up a series of badges in this. So we have a whole infrastructure. Um, and what we do is we say, let's say you want the badge for online collaborative inquiry, which is right there. If you want the badge, you have to basically earn and pledge for the badge. The way that you do that is, number one, you go through and you read all the materials that are in. Uh, this module. After you read through all the materials, after you've gone through all the different components, then what I want you to do is I want you to go to the, the Google Plus community and answer the reflection question. OK? Pretty easy. The last thing that we want you to do is we want you to create either a lesson plan or a unit plan, an overview, using some aspect of online collaborative inquiry 
in it and share it with others. So as a way to motivate teachers to share their work and share their ideas, we had this learning exemplars group. So this is a Google group that we built up because as a teacher, one of the things that we do best is that we take the ideas of others and, uh, and you know, modify for our own students. And so I wanted to have, you know, my idea is I want you to take the work of other teachers and see what they do with it. That's the real power. So if you share, then we basically give you a badge for that module. So we have five badges. Uh, this one up here is online content construction. This is the one for online collaborative inquiry. This is the digital identity one. That was a lot of debate getting the QR code, and it still is a point of contention. Um, and then reading comprehension, and this is multimodal tutorial. Do you guys want to share why it was a point of contention? wanted to assign something as hard as a barcode or a QR code to something that where you're supposed to be developing your own online identity. Um, is that, it was too impersonal. They were yeah. for some more, more humanized. We initially started with, the because if you develop badges and if you read all the Mozilla open badges stuff, it's really fascinating, but really the graphic is the least of the concerns. All the metadata behind the badge is the real important part. But as human beings, we really associate with the graphic. And so we, we sent these out to different groups and we said, okay, which works the best? All of the other badges, for the most part, made sense except for digital identity. Um, because initially we started with a barcode. And Half the people said, okay, great, that makes sense, a barcode sounds good. A lot of other people said, I'm not a barcode, I'm a human being. It didn't help also that, uh, you'll notice there's another block of people here that's our orientation, our pre-service teachers. A lot of our pre-service students were reading feed, okay? And so they didn't like the idea of having a barcode associated with their identity. Um, then we tried to use a fingerprint, but the fingerprint didn't really look weird, it looked very awkward. Uh, then we went to the QR code. So it, it, we were all in these middle areas of like QR code, fingerprint, barcode, and then I basically was like, we're going with the QR code, we're moving on. Um, but the in defense of the QR code, the point of the QR code is that you can make an individual one for anything. Right. Yeah. Like, exactly. which, which makes sense to the people who were in defense and not who were for QR code. <laughs> it was tough, but it was, it was awesome. I mean, you guys are going to share a lot of that thinking later. Um, so I mean, it, we have a badging system. And the way that the badging system rolled, right now we're beta testing this. We're in the last week of really beta testing it. Um, I, we will have an initial cohort of educators globally that want to go through this MOOC and get these badges. Uh, one of the cool things is that we already have teachers from you know Africa and all over saying we never get this sort of the, this information or these ideas. Can we be involved in the community? I'm like yes, you know of course. Um, so we will start right around the ALA conference uh, is in Hartford this year, the American Library Association. Um, but keep in touch with me if you're interested. What we'll do is, in the real first launching of this, we'll put it out there. Uh, it'll probably, I would say, each module will take two weeks to complete. Um, and as you know, with MOOCs, that extends a little bit. Uh, but basically, we have the five badges. If you get all five badges, then you automatically unlock a meta-level badge. So you have one badge that says that you are a mentor in the community. And then basically, you are just like me. I want this to be community run and community organized. I want, you know, if you, if you complete all of these and you, have, you are a mentor in the community, then you can go in and edit the Google site. You can also go in and you can bring other students through. So you can go back to your district and run this and give badges to other people and you can award badges as well. Uh, and that basically adds up to the mentor level badge. So that was an uh, overview 
of a lot of work that we've been working on uh, for probably about a year and a half, two years. Uh, the development of the online research media skills model, and then the badging system to go along with it, and then the, the MOOC, the Google Sites piece, is just an open ed resource to pull it all together. Questions? Is that part of the Mozilla badging? Or is it yeah, just it's the same. In, it's inspired by slash part of it. Um, I learned, if you follow along on my blog, I learned a really good lesson. Um, is that the Mozilla badging system at badges.mozilla. Um, I built the original badging. They don't know this yet. I built the original badges there. Apparently, Mozilla decided to go clean house about two weeks ago, about a month ago, and they wiped out my badges. And what they have never been really clear on is the fact that they don't really want you building the badges there or at badge.us, B-A-D-G.us. Um, they want you to use other platforms. So what we're going to do is we're going to run our own. There is a plugin, a PHP plugin for Google Sites that you can use your own badging uh, host. Um, there is one for WordPress. Um, there are different companies that will do it. Uh, I've been in talks with Coterie uh, that will host your badges and run your badges for you. There's also, what's the other big one that's out there? Anybody do badges at all? Yeah, there's another badge host out there. Um, so it, it's inspired by and it's part of the Mozilla Open Badges initiative, but it's just being aware of the fact that... The badges aren't very open then. That was my <laughs> big takeaway. Is it, my concern came, and, and they're going to go in depth on like development of badges and what you have to do. And we spent a lot of time researching. On my blog, I document all of it. We spent a lot of time thinking about, we did a lit review on badges. We identified everything we possibly would ever want to know about badges. And then we got to the point that said, OK, we've got graphics. We have the metadata. We have the definition. We know what these badges are. And then I figured, add them to badges.mozilla. Done. Added them. We were all happy. They were there. I went back to go award some badges and, and you know, tweak some of the definitions. And they were gone. And Mozilla came back and they said, well, we never said that you could host these at our site. And I go, yeah, you did. Like, so that, I, I think the issue is that from what I learned is I, I, we learned a difficult lesson, you know, and we're one of the few people apparently globally that are trying to build them and trying to build them there. Um, and so we learned a lesson. Now, as a result, one of the nice things is Mozilla is cleaning up that, and they're having more PD and more community calls and stuff like that. So they're trying to clean up what they do, but apparently what they meant by open is it's an open badging initiative, but you run it. And so that was the part that wasn't clear to me. Questions? It's a lot of info. Get in touch with me. Uh, I put all this up on the blog. I think all this should be out there. Um, and with that, are you guys here next? Yeah. All right. I will leave this Is off. There a, a link to your, uh, what you just showed us there? I will put it all up on the Twitter feed right now. Is it on the, um, the blog? Is there a link to that on the blog? Yep. Everything's on the blog. Yeah, so if, if you go. If you go to. If you go there and you search for, yeah, so on the left under tags, if you s click on ORMS, it'll have all of the, bad, the posts there.